Okay, so uh, <coughs> let us carry on where we finished off yesterday. We are looking at this uh, sutta called the Kalaha Vivada Sutta, Quarrels and Disputes. And uh, the idea here is to trace the problem of quarrels and disputes, in other words, or so much of the suffering in the world, to trace it backwards and to find the source of these issues. That's really what the sutta is about. Uh, and it's kind of tracing things stage by stage, uh, looking at things in a causal way, you know, what conditions what, uh, and how can bring it back to the root problem. Uh, and uh, yesterday we came back to uh, the idea of a passa, contact or experience in the world. Uh, and we asked the question, what actually is the cause of our experience of the world? Why do we contact the world uh, through the senses? Uh, and this is where we are at. And I'm going to look at the last part here fairly quickly because it's very uh, deep. And I must admit, I'm not entirely sure if I really understand what is going on. The Pali is very kind of complicated and tricky. And I look at the translation, I don't even sure if I understand the translations. I'm not sure if the translators understood what they were translating, etc. So it's all a bit kind of obscure here. So let's see what is, uh, what is going on here. So the, the question we had a look at yesterday was, um, so where does contact in the world spring from? Uh, yeah, this, on, this is on page 23. Yeah, uh, And possessions too. Uh, where do they come from? Uh, when what is absent, is there no possessiveness? When what disappears, do contacts not strike? In other words, there is no experience. Name and form cause contact. Possessions spring from wishing. Uh, when wishing is absent, uh, there is no possessiveness. Uh, when form disappears, uh, contacts don't strike. So, uh, the uh, idea here between name and form causing contact, as we discussed very briefly yesterday in the Q&A session, is that uh, contact, to contact the world, uh, to experience the world, there's two things that you require. On the one hand, you require the physical element, uh, yeah, like the sensitive tissue or whatever of the eye or the ear or whatever. If you haven't got an eye, you can't see. So the physical part is required. Uh, and then there's the mental part behind that, which kind of interprets what comes in through the senses. And these things are two quite specific names in the Pali Suttas. It's called Patiga Sampasa and uh, Adivajana Sampasa. Patiga Sampasa means like uh, impingement contact, yeah, the idea of hitting the physical element. Uh, and uh, Adivajana, Adivajana means like uh, expression or... Um, or um, Description, maybe. Description is, is probably maybe a good translation. Yes, a description contact, uh, meaning that you're describing or understanding or naming. That's why it's called name, basically, because you are naming that thing which uh, comes in through the senses. Yeah? And the, the process of naming is a process of understanding. Uh, it's very similar to the idea of perception, because when we perceive the world, we split the world up into kind of entities to make sense of the world. Uh, so both of these are required, then there is contact. And what this means is that, one of the things that it means is that when we see the world or experience the world, uh, it is not just the world coming into our minds. Uh, we are always interpreting that with thing which we see. We never see reality directly. We see it through the interpretation of the mind. Uh, so depending on uh, your mental state, you will see the world in different ways. And, and some of the most fundamental problems with the mind is that it is very biased. Yeah? There's a very large bias going on in the mind. Uh, and that bias means that we see, uh, we see things that are not really there. And this is kind of the problem on the whole Buddhist path, because one of the main things that we see through that bias of the mind, we see a self. Yeah? We see I exist. Uh, we, we relate things to the self. This is my stuff. This is not my stuff. Uh, this is important to me. This is a, you know, and then this, we build up this whole big problem out of mere sense experience because we interpret it through this idea of describing things or, or um, giving name to things uh, in a way which actually does not correspond to the reality itself. Uh, 
So this is why insight is so important, yeah? because when you have insight into the nature of reality, we can correct that mis misperception, that misdescription of what actually is going on here. So we no longer kind of um, uh, you know, mess up what we are seeing. Yeah? And this is why you have that very famous quote in the Bahia. There's a famous sutta called the Bahia Sutta that is often quoted in Buddhism. And uh, it's not just found there, it's found that same sutta, the same idea is also found elsewhere in the Pali Canon. Uh, and that sutta is the sutta where the Buddha says to Bahia, Bahia is this wanderer, uh, and the Buddha says to him, in the scene, let there merely be the scene. In the herd, merely be the herd. In other words, don't interpret these things. Uh, don't add things to the, what you see that actually isn't there. Don't describe it beyond the mere fact of seeing it. Uh, yeah, don't add a self in there. That's kind of the root problem of everything else. We're adding a self to our experience. And from that addition of a self comes the idea of possessiveness, comes the idea of views, comes all the craving in the world. All the bad things really originate from that. So name and form yeah, are the source of that contact in the world. And they lead to all kinds of misunderstanding of what is going on here. And possessions spring from wishing, yeah, wishing again, uh, again also rooted ultimately in the sense of self, uh, that kind of makes sense. Uh, and when form disappears, uh, contacts don't strike because you, it needs to, you need the sensory, the senses, the sensory apparatus or whatever you want to call it for contact to happen. So if there is no form, uh, if that uh, whole sensory apparatus is gone, then you don't really have contact. Maybe with the exception of uh, the immaterial attainments, but uh, anyway. Let's uh, come to the very last part here. So how to proceed so that form disappears? Yeah? If you want to avoid contact, you avoid form. And how do happiness and suffering disappear? Tell me how they disappear. I think we ought to know these things. <laughs> So uh, the someone is very keen here on the Dhamma, which is kind of nice. Uh, and this is what the Buddha replies. And this is very, this part here is what is really kind of hard to grasp what is going on here. Uh. But this is how it's translated by Bhante Sujato. He says, without normal perception or distorted perception, not lacking perception, uh, nor perceiving what has disappeared. Uh, that is how to proceed so that form disappears. Uh. For concepts of identity due to proliferation spring from perception. <laughs> so, you know, you can, it's really hard to understand exactly what this is supposed to mean, but we can give a general idea of the meaning of this. And uh, the general idea, because we know basically how the Dhamma works, yeah, and so the, um, uh, without going into the details of what this <laughs> might mean, uh, uh, you can just say that the root of the problem here is this idea of the proliferation, yeah, identity, concepts of identity due to proliferation. Uh, this is the root problem. Uh, and you see this in a number of suttas. You see it in the Madhupindika Sutta, Honeyball Sutta, Majjhimanikaya 18. You find it there. You find it in the Sakapanya Sutta, which I mentioned the other day, Diganikaya 21. Uh, again, this idea of Papancha Sanya Sanka, the proliferations that arise proliferation in regard to identity that arise in the world. Uh, yeah? And this is kind of the root problem of the whole issue here. Uh, these concepts of identity due to proliferation. Yeah? We, you perceive something and then you make something out of it which doesn't actually exist. Uh, in fact, the very fact of perceiving, uh, the very perception that we have uh, probably is already tinged or probably already proliferate, it probably already distorted. You cannot perceive anything without that distortion. The eye always gets involved in everything here. And this is the root problem of this whole round. And uh, so once the eye gets involved in the world, then possessiveness, then craving, then views. And this whole sequence of things comes out of this. And uh, already in this life, yeah, this sutta here has nothing to do with rebirth. It just kind of analyzes the conflicts we have in this very existence. Uh, and even in this very existence, in this life, a lot of the problems we have, uh, all problems we have basically, arise out of the sense of me, uh, I, 
I exist, uh, this distortion of perception that we have, uh, the sense of self uh, that the Buddha says doesn't correspond to any reality. It's kind of weird. Yeah? We buy into this delusion, we buy into this non-reality, uh, and then from that non-reality, from this thing which doesn't exist, uh, we cause all the problems in the world, all the wars, all the violence, all the selfishness, all the greed. Everything comes out of something which doesn't exist. It's kind of weird, isn't it? Uh, uh, we live in this kind of deluded reality, says the Buddha. And of course, the way to overcome this is then to see that that reality actually, there is no such reality. There is no I there. Uh, this whole supposition that we have that we exist in a certain way is actually false. And when that is seen through, all of the problems in the world fall away. And this is just dealing with the problems in this life. But of course, from a Buddhist point of view, the really deep problem is not actually this life. The really deep one is that this just carries on. It goes on and on and on and on. This is the deeper problem. And that problem too is resolved the moment you understand, you see through the delusion of the sense of self. So everything is resolved through that, that problem. That is the root problem of everything. Yeah. And that is why so much of Buddhism uh, is geared towards seeing through this delusion. Uh. Yeah, we often talk about the idea of understanding non-self, uh, understanding impermanence, understanding suffering. These are all just various angles on exactly the same problem uh, because that is, that is the issue which causes everything. All suffering in the world comes from that. Uh. That's why this is kind of Everything we do is kind of geared towards that on the Buddhist path. Uh, and the whole uh, Noble Eightfold Path really is about that particular problem. Uh, and uh, the delusion of uh, self is uncovered gradually. Yeah? You start to see it gradually, gradually. And of course, the less of a self you have, the less of an ego you have, it's already getting better. Yeah? It's better to have uh, less ego than more ego. Uh, so it's a gradual uncovering. Yeah? until one day you kind of have the big breakthrough and you really see what is going on uh, and the whole thing falls apart. Uh. So this is a kind of a complicated way, a poetic way of uh, finding the source of the issue, what really is the source of the problem in the world. Uh. So um, let's count, go down just to the very last verses here. Uh, whatever I asked you, Whatever I asked, you have explained to me. I ask you once more, please tell me this. Do some astute folk here say that this is the extent of purification of the spirit? Or do they say it is something else? Yeah, in other words, is this the end of the path or is there more to it? Some astute folk do say that this is the highest extent of purification of the spirit. But some of them, claiming to be experts, uh, speak of a time when nothing remains, uh, knowing that these states are dependent, uh, and knowing uh, what they depend on. Uh, the inquiring sage, uh, having understood, uh, is freed and does not dispute. Uh, the wise do not go on into life after life. So here at the very end we come back to the idea of rebirth again. Uh, yeah, life after life, uh, bringing that in because that is ultimately what this whole path is about. Uh, and uh, this uh, last part here yeah, the, is the idea this person who is asking the Buddha doesn't really seem to be a Buddhist perhaps, seems to be an outsider, uh, doesn't really understand what the highest goal of the Buddhist path is about. Uh, so what is the highest purification of the spirit? Is it a particular attainment like an immaterial attainment? Uh, what is it? And the Buddha replies that the experts, and these are the, uh, the Pali word here is the pandita. The pandita are like the, the wise people in the world. And they say there comes a time when nothing remains. Yeah, Anupadisesa, actually Kusala is the expert here. And nothing remains, everything is gone, everything is thrown out. And this is kind of the weird thing about the Buddhist path, yeah, when everything ends, uh, no more experience, that is considered the highest happiness in Buddhism. And it's, this is what, what makes Buddhism such a weird teaching and such a hard teaching to grasp. It is extraordinarily profound. But this is what distinguishes Buddhism from anything else. Yeah? 
uh, from uh, kind of the ancient uh, Hindu tradition of attaining some kind of universal union with Brahma or God or anything like that. Uh, Buddhism doesn't have any of that. Uh, it is about the complete emptiness. There's nothing there. There's nothing to hold on to. There's no core to anything. Uh, and so all there is really at the end is just nothing. Uh, there isn't even nothing because nothing might be considered to be the experience of nothing, but everything comes to an end. Uh, Anupadisesa, nothing remains. Uh, so this is uh, kind of the final part here. Huh? And um, yeah, so then the very last verse then, knowing that these states are dependent uh, and knowing what they depend on, having understood uh, the sage, inquiring sage is freed and does not dispute. Uh, the wise do not go on uh, into life after life. Uh, <coughs> Anyways, I'll leave that for your contemplation. <laughs> it is, uh, it's uh, interesting, uh, but it's also a bit poetic, and sometimes when things are poetic, they are particularly hard to understand because uh, poetry is there to inspire, it is there to give a feeling for things, uh, not always to give a very accurate description. Uh, the accurate description you find usually in prose, uh, it is often more kind of emotional in a sense. Uh, so um, let's leave that aside for now. Uh, and um, now, after making that big detour, we're going to come back to the Potapada Sutta. So the detour has lasted a few days, but that's fine. Huh? <laughs> Sorry? The roadblocks are finished, right. You get, get some of the roadblocks out of the way. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. So. Um, Come back to page four, I think it is. <coughs> and uh, so what we have just been doing is really having a kind of extended discussion of the idea of sense restraint. This last sutta was a bit more than that, but uh, the, um, the idea is just to learn how to look at the world, look at people, use wisdom in our every, everyday life so as to overcome some of these defilements that make the mind unstable, that make the mind unpleasant to be with. Yeah? All of this is really geared towards all of that. Uh, and uh, one of the most important things in uh, what we have been going through, to my mind, is the Sutta on resentment. Yeah? It's such a practical Sutta. It is something everyone has problems with every now and again. Uh, having a bit of ill will, getting upset with other people. Uh, yeah, the world is a place where it's very easy to get into conflict with people. Uh, and so this sutta on resentment is very powerful and incredibly useful. Uh, so to me, that is one of the, maybe the core message uh, in terms of sense restraint. Uh, and then there is the other idea, which is the idea of how to learn to look at the world in such a way uh, that will then allow us to go deeper in meditation practice. Yeah, the reason why we can't go deeper is because we hold on to the world in the wrong way. By letting go a little bit more, uh, our meditation will often deepen as a consequence. So these are the two main uh, messages there. And now we're going to move on to the next passage uh, <coughs> in this gradual training. Having looked at sensory strength, uh, we're going to look at Sati Sampajanya, uh, which is here translated as mindfulness and situational awareness is the uh, translation by Bhantasujato and this is the standard passage on this in the suttas. This is how it reads. And how does a mendicant have mindfulness and situational awareness? It is when a mendicant acts with situational awareness when going out and coming back when looking ahead and looking aside, when bending and extending the limbs, when bearing the outer robe, bowl and robes, when eating, drinking, chewing and tasting, when urinating and defecating, when walking, standing, sitting, sleeping, waking, speaking and keeping silent. That is how a mendicant has mindfulness and situational awareness. So what does this actually mean? What is the point of this? What is actually going on here? And um, 
Uh, first of all, the idea of situational awareness here, sampajanya. Sampajanya, the idea here is that whatever situation you are in, you are aware, yeah, whether that, whether you are doing what is appropriate to that situation. That's really what it comes down to. The purpose of this passage is to, uh, to uh, know whether you are doing things that are conducive to the spiritual path. Yeah? All the things that we have to do during the day, we choose whether to do this or to do that or whatever. Uh, and we always have the awareness at, at the back of our mind, is this going to be conducive? Uh, is it going to be leading in the right direction or is it not? Uh, how often should I go to the casino? Yeah? <laughs> Maybe not at all. Yeah, that's kind of one, one possible answer to that one. Yeah. Or I'm just saying that because it's kind of an obvious one. Yeah, but uh, we, we want basically we want to have awareness uh, of what we are doing here. Yeah. And uh, this, the way that it is described here, this, remember, the, because this particular expression of the gradual training starts with the going forth, uh, so it really is about the monastic life. That does not mean it doesn't apply to lay life, it applies to everyone, but this is a description of the monastic life. And so the things that you see in this passage here are really the things that concern monastics. Yeah? When you're outside of the monastery, when you're not doing your meditation practice or whatever, this is what you do. Uh, you go out, yeah? you go into the village, uh, you come back from the village. Uh, you receive arms. This is kind of what is meant by extending your limbs. It means like you extend your arms bowl to receive arms food. Yeah? This is kind of what this is about. Otherwise, it seems a bit strange. Extending your limbs, what are you talking about? But this is kind of what's going on here. You're looking ahead and looking aside because you have to see whether people want to offer you something or not. Yeah? So you have an awareness of what is going on. But you do it for the right reasons. You don't go into the village for the wrong reasons, yeah? to enjoy the pleasures of the village, to go into Perth to look at all the kind of advertisements and all the people running around and, and then I don't know what else you might, you know, all the sensuality in the city. A lot of sensuality is to be found in the cities and even in villages. You don't go for that reason, you go for the right reason. So you are aware in this sense and some of the things here are very important, right? Especially things like eating, what does it mean to have full awareness when you are eating and drinking? Well, what it means is that you know the right amount. You know the right kind of food to eat, what is suitable, what will help you to, you know, to practice in a good way, what will not make you sleep for a long time afterwards. You don't eat too much, you don't eat too little. You know the middle way, you know what is appropriate for you. This is kind of the idea with having clear awareness in regard to eating. Now, there's a very important point here. Huh? The translation here says, when eating, huh? yeah, when eating, you have situational awareness. Huh? But actually, I think that's the wrong translation. Huh? And I, I'm a bit, bit disappointed about the Sudrato <laughs> has translated in this way, yeah? because, of course, I'm right and he is wrong, of course. So it's, always, <laughs> it's always like that. <laughs> I'm sure he probably has an argument. I don't know if he has an argument, but I, have, I certainly have an argument against this one. Huh? And it is not, and, 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 it, it actually, and what is interesting, it actually matters how you translate these things, yeah? Kalavivada. <laughs> no, we don't, actually we don't do that very much. We, we, have, we have very civilized discussions usually. <laughs> we don't kind of get into fist fights or anything like that. But, um, so, uh, but, but the point here is that, yes, it's okay to be mindful while you eat, but that's not really what is at stake here. Huh? What is at stake is to know how to eat in the right way. What is the quantity you're supposed to eat? What is, what is suitable food? Yeah? It is not mindfulness when eating, but mindfulness about eating. Yeah? Yeah, doing this thing in a suitable way. Yeah? It doesn't mean you should not be mindful while you're eating, but that is not really what this is about. Yeah? And that's very interesting because uh, you very often, when, you, when we talk about the idea of uh, Mindfulness in Buddhism, yeah, satipatthana practice, all of these kind of things, usually the idea is you're told to be mindful while eating. Yeah? That's what we're normally told. Uh, but actually, this is not what this probably doesn't mean. This It probably means more to have a general idea of what you're doing is appropriate for your practice. Uh, that is probably what it means. Uh, and then actually it has a much clearer purpose, yeah, because what is the purpose of just being mindful while you eat? Well, 
it's not entirely clear what the purpose of that is, except being mindful. But here we have a very clear purpose. The purpose is to do that which is suitable for the practice on the path. And that this interpretation actually is correct becomes much more clear further down, because one of the, the words here, one of the things that you're supposed to be mindful of is you're supposed to be when sleeping, yeah? when walking, standing, sitting, and sleeping. How can you have clear awareness when sleeping? It's impossible. Yeah? Even the arahants can't be clearly aware when they're sleeping, because yeah? when you're sleeping, you're out of it, uh, by definition. Yeah? So, but once you start to change the translation to about sleeping, yeah, then it makes sense. Yeah? Because about sleep means you know the right quantity of sleep, yeah? You know that you should not sleep too little nor too much. You should sleep the amount that gives rise to mindfulness, yeah, when you have maximum alertness and these kind of things. You sleep at the right time, so maybe you have a short nap after the meal, or maybe you sleep you know, at, at everything at night, whatever works for you in that kind of sense. Then the whole thing falls into place. And I think that is kind of the critical thing for understanding how that passage works. And almost everyone gets this wrong, as far as I can see. Almost everyone translates it as when, and it doesn't actually make sense in this particular context. So um, that, I think, is a kind of unlocks some of the meaning of what is going on here. Uh, you are aware in relation to these things. Uh, when you go into the village and back, you have a general sense of purpose of why you're doing it. Uh, you're not just mindful moment to moment, but you know the purpose of why you're doing this. Uh, when looking aside, when receiving the food, you do that in the right way. Yeah? You carry your robes in the appropriate manner, etc. Yeah? Um, you speak, yeah? you have a, per a sense of purpose. You're not just aware and mindful that you are speaking, but you have a sense of purpose of why you are speaking. Why are you saying this? Uh, am I just blabbering on aimlessly? Yeah? Or am I actually saying something which is uh, you know, reasonable and useful and uh, not just kind of wasting people's time or whatever, this sort of thing, right? Then everything kind of comes into, uh, falls into place, so to speak. Keeping silent, yeah, you're silent at the right time, but you do speak when it is required. Sometimes it is important to speak a little bit, uh, yeah, just to welcome people or whatever. Uh, so then all of these things uh, kind of work. And this fits very well with how this is defined elsewhere. Uh, this idea of situational awareness is defined in the commentaries, uh, and it is defined into four aspects. The basic idea is that you are aware of the purpose and suitability of what you're doing. Yeah, yeah sapaya and uh, sapaya, uh, sapaya, sampajanya and. Uh, Atta Sampajanya, something like that. So you, are, you know the purpose and suitability, yeah? the purpose of why you're doing some things, and is it suitable the way you are doing it? And then you are on the right track. The commentary then adds two further things, and one of those is the Gochara Sampajanya, which means the, the Gochara again is the grazing ground, yeah? it's where you hang out. And according to the commentary, that is the Sampajanya of always being aware of your meditation object. Yeah. Now, that is true, but only in certain contexts. And Sampajanya is, uh, this is kind of the preliminary aspect of Sampajanya, the preliminary aspect of situational awareness, yeah, is in our everyday life. But of course, you take that Sampajanya, the idea of awareness, also with you into your meditation practice. So when you see the standard formula of the Satipatthana, it always says Sampajano, Satima, Sampajano, Vinaya Loki Abhijadomanasang. Sampajano, you also have Sampajanya when you meditate. Yeah, when you med do meditation, you are aware. Are you doing what is appropriate? Or are you thinking about all kinds of stuff? Are you hanging out with the breath? Or are you hanging out with your fantasies? Yeah, this is kind of the idea here. So Sampajanya within the scope of meditation, then this idea of uh, Gochara makes sense. Yeah? You're always with the meditation object. You're staying with the meditation object at all times. Ideally, you come back to it. But it does not make sense in this context here. So Sampajanya has different levels depending on what you're doing. Yeah? The preliminary level is to understand the purpose and suitability of what you're doing. That's like everyday Sampajanya. 
Then there is sampajanya in meditation practice. It's more profound and deeper. That is where you have awareness of your meditation object at all times. It's important to get the the right kind of sampajanya in the right place. Otherwise, you think you have to be aware of your meditation object in everyday life. And that doesn't make any sense because it's impossible, basically. People try, it can't be done. And then, finally, the final sampajanya is the asamoha sampajanya, the non-delusion um, uh, awareness. And that is kind of even more profound, yeah? When you kind of... Uh, uh, do insight practices or you do contemplations that actually lead to the very end of the Buddhist path. So these things at the right time and sometimes they are lumped together into one group. All, every one of them is always applicable but I think that is, a, is the wrong way of understanding this uh, because it doesn't really, it's not possible to do these things in ordinary life. And uh, as, uh, you know, for most practitioners on the path, we're trying to get our samadhi together, trying to go into deeper meditation. Th some of these deeper aspects don't make sense. You don't start out with asamoha, the non-delusion, because it is too profound. You leave that aside for later aspects, later time, when the path becomes more profound uh, as you go down the track. Yeah. So uh, that is the idea of Sampajanya, and uh, you can use this in your life as well, even though this here is a monastic way of talking about it, you can use this in your ordinary life. What is it that is useful for the spiritual path, yeah? And you start to use maybe the internet more wisely, you use entertainment in general more wisely, yeah. you, you know, how do you live your daily life? And I know many of you already live your life extremely well, you know, you're, uh, you are kind of living this path almost fully, many of you, yeah. and that's wonderful. Yeah. And this is part of the contemplation. You should then ask yourself, yeah, what are the things that really lead forward on the path? Yeah. And uh, then you're on the right track. Yeah. Don't take it too far. Sometimes you may need a bit of relaxation or whatever, so find that balance again. Don't become a kind of a, a person who uh, uh, makes life miserable because you're trying, trying too hard. Yeah. Yeah, life is supposed to be enjoyable, that's kind of the point. So find that balance in all of these kind of things. So there you are, Sati Sampajanya in, in brief. Um, one of the important points here, and this is a point that I made on the uh, recent workshop we had on uh, Satipatthana at the Dhammaloka, is that uh, Sati Sampajanya comes before Satipatthana practice. Yeah, in the, uh, this uh, page here, you have mindfulness. If you look at the gradual training, you have mindfulness and situational awareness. Then you have contentment coming next. And then you have giving up the hindrances. And giving up the hindrances, uh, that is where Satipatthana comes in. Uh, and we'll see that in a second. So this comes before Satipatthana practice. And you see this in a number of places in the suttas where these are separate things. Sati Sampajanya is one thing. Satipatthana is something else. So situational awareness comes first, Satipatthana comes later. Yeah, this is an important point again because it means that uh, the ordinary activities in daily life are not really part of Satipatthana practice. Satipatthana is more profound. Satipatthana is something we do when we sit down, you cross your legs or something like that and you watch your breath. That's Satipatthana practice. And it is an important distinction because uh, uh, if we reduce things, if we make them into something less than they actually are, then the whole path actually gets reduced as a consequence. The profundity of the path also, the path loses some of its profundity if we do that. Uh, so it is really fairly important that we get things defined in the right way. Otherwise, we uh, end up with a, a you know, Nibbana light kind of thing here. Yeah, Jhana light, Nibbana light, uh, all of these kind of things. Uh, and don't really want that. We want to follow what the Buddha taught. That's not kind of the whole point. Okay, so let's have a look at the little passage on contentment. And how is a mendicant content? It is when a mendicant is content with the robes to look after the body, an arms food to look after the belly. Wherever they go, they set out, taking only these things. They are like a bird. Whatever it flies, wings are its only burden. 
In the same way, a mendicant is content with the robes to look after the body and alms food to look after the belly. Wherever they go, they set out, taking only these things. That is how a mendicant is content. And uh, it's a very kind of inspiring little passage. Yeah? All you have is the robes and then you have your bowl uh, yeah, to get the alms food. Uh, and uh, you know, ideally, you don't have anything more than that. That's all. That's kind of a very, very simple life that you live. Uh, yeah, and sometimes you see people like this, even you know, um, monastics who actually have very, very little in their life, uh, and uh, it's very inspiring. Ajahn Brahm always tells the tells story of uh, going up to Ajahn Shah's kuti, Ajahn Shah, of course, being Ajahn Brahm's teacher in Thailand, and going up to his kuti and com coming inside, and there's nothing there. There's like an arms bowl in the corner, maybe a, a robe hanging over a, 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 a a robe rack or something like that, or something very simple, uh, and that's pretty much all there is. Uh, yeah, maybe there's a spittoon in the corner because I think he he chewed beetle nuts, so probably spittoon in there, so he can kind of spit at suitable times into the spittoon. Uh, uh, we still have spittoons up on another monastery. I don't know if you noticed, uh, but we never use them for their purpose. Uh, it's kind of they're sitting there. We call them spittoons, but they don't actually use that spittoons anymore. So maybe we should. Uh, I don't know what we should do about that, uh, whether we should start spitting more or what we should uh, <laughs> call, the, call them something else. Uh, what was that? Taking up chewing Taking up Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> it would be interesting, wouldn't it? Uh, would be, uh, yeah, it would be messy. Yeah, yeah it's, not very, it's not very, it's a bit kind of, uh, <laughs> I don't know if I would recommend it. Uh, it's a bit disgusting, to be honest. But anyway, <clears throat> this is what they did. That was part of that culture. And of course, it's part of your culture. It's not disgusting anymore. It's only when you kind of move away from that, it may look that way. Yeah. So, but very simple lifestyle, yeah? P just wandering around, having very, very simple things. Uh, and it's something that, to me, is inspiring. And I always try to I go back to my cute and think, what should I chuck out of my cute? <laughs> okay, too many books. Let me chuck out some of these books from the cute. Yeah. And that's kind of a nice, thing to, a nice thing to do, actually, to throw things out. It's a, very, it's a marvelous thing. Then you wander around in the world. Uh, all you have is your robes and bowls. Very simple. Uh, it means you're very mobile. Yeah? There's nothing to hold you back anymore. Uh, you can move around. Uh, and uh, this is... Of course, far easier if you live in a climate that is a bit, uh, uh, you know, conducive to these kind of things, especially if you're going to move around and sleep at the root of a tree, etc. It's a bit c too cold here in Perth to do that at, during the winter time. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, still it is a very kind of free way of living. You're like a bird uh, with the wings as its only burden. Uh, yeah, this kind of the final burden is the wings uh, and uh, the ball and rob, the final burden. Uh, and the burden that leads to no burden down the track. Yeah. So the idea of contentment is very important. And uh, because when we are content, it means that so much of the things in the mind, the desires, the attachments, the ill will, they go at the same time. Contentment is the opposite of desire. Yeah? So here we are really purifying the mind of desire. Yeah? And it fits very well at this point in the path because we have now done the sense restraint. When there is no sense restraint, uh, there's going to be lots of desire and ill will and aversion. Uh, so first of all, you have to have the sense restraint. Uh, then you have to not have an idea of the purpose of what you're doing. You don't give rise to unnecessary desires in the world. Uh, and then the contentment falls into place. This passage on contentment is actually found in different places in the suttas. It's kind of a bit confusing. In some suttas, like the uh, shorter sutta on the elephant's footprint, uh, the very famous sutta, the Chula Hatipadopama Sutta, Majjhima 27, the contentment passage is earlier. Uh, it comes before sense restraint. Uh, and that leads to the question, is there a mistake in the suttas that it comes later in one place and earlier in another place? Uh, or is it just a natural diversity in the suttas? Uh, and the answer is it's very hard to say which one it is. It could be natural diversity, but then again, suttas don't tend to have so much natural diversity because it is an oral tradition. You tend to have a certain standardized way of, of making things. So I would say that the more natural sequence is the sequence we see here because to really be content, you really need that sense restraint first. 
On the other hand, maybe you could argue that there is a preliminary kind of contentment before sense restraint, yeah, that then makes the sense restraint possible afterwards. It doesn't matter so much, but I think this is maybe the more natural place for this. And then you are content, yeah, and there's something beautiful about being content, not needing anything in the world, not desiring anything, being satisfied with what you have. And there's something very kind of peaceful about that, right? And uh, it is not just for monastics. It is whether if you are a lay person, it's the same thing. Yeah, if you are content with what you have in life, uh, you don't really want any more. Uh, what you have is sufficient. Uh, it leads to a kind of peaceful existence. Uh, but the ever, always demanding more, always going to something new, uh, it leads to kind of this agitated and restless kind of lifestyle. Uh, and um, for that reason, there is this beautiful verse in the Dhammapada, which you, many of you probably know, is the idea of uh, contentment being the highest wealth. Yeah, contentment is the highest wealth. It's a beautiful way of putting it, uh, because the highest wealth, we usually measure it in very, very different ways. We think of the highest wealth as, you know, I don't know, Elon Musk or someone like that or whatever. Yeah, This is the highest wealth. But I don't think Elon Musk is very content. He doesn't come across as a very content person. He's always driving forward, yeah? working incredibly hard. He comes across as very discontent, if you're going to be honest about it. And, uh, so, and that discontent means that you always want more. Whatever it might be that you want, whether it is getting your company to work or status or money or whatever it is, you want more. And because you want more, you haven't got enough. That is the very de definition of not having enough, is that you want more. And it goes to show you that no matter how much you have in the world, yeah, if you want more, you haven't got enough. But if you are content, you have enough. And that's why contentment is the highest wealth. Yeah, it's kind of counter counterintuitive. And people think, yeah, you're just foolish. You're content with nothing. You know, what's wrong with you? Go out and make, make you know, get a life, <laughs> or, or, or whatever that people say, say to you. So uh, there's something very, very beautiful about the idea of contentment. And then you can kind of just be in the world, exist in the world, and you become this kind of peaceful person that moves through life without making a big, big racket or uproar. You just kind of move very simply through life because you're not agitated, you're not restless. There's no friction when you move through the world because you're not kind of trying to fulfill these endless desires, endless things that never, never really have a final conclusion to them. So uh, contentment. We're now moving very close to meditation practice, right? Because when you are content in this way, those defilements that block meditation are largely abandoned at this point. There's very, very few defilements left in the mind at this point. There still may be little things going on. The mind is still maybe thinking about things occasionally. There's still little things, but you're coming close to meditation. And that is why the next passage now is really about meditation practice. So let's look, move slowly into the next passage here, which is about giving up the hindrances, yeah, the nivarana in Pali, pancha nivarana, the five hindrances. So let's have a look at this. And this is, a, a, now we are kind of moving into the realm uh, of the more profounder aspects of the Dhamma. So, the Buddha starts out, he says, when they have this noble spectrum of ethics, this noble sense restraint, this noble mindfulness and situational awareness, this noble contentment, they frequent a secluded lodging, a wilderness, the root of a tree, a hill, a ravine, a mountain cave, a charnel ground, a forest, the open air, a heap of straw. After their meal, they return from arms round, sit down cross-legged with their body straight, and establish mindfulness right there. So this is a introductory passage. And uh, first of all, it summarizes all the things that we have done so far, yeah? The whole spectrum of eth ethics, the word spectrum here again is kanda. Let me just bring up the uh, Pali for this. Uh, <coughs> uh, so spectrum is uh, kanda. 
Sila, sila Kanda, yeah, the whole kind of uh, group of ethics. And you will notice it is called noble. Yeah. It is, it's kind of nice, isn't it? This is a, these are noble things. When you live in this way, this is called Arya. So when you live according to these principles, you have a noble life, says the Buddha. Isn't that kind of, isn't that nice? And sometimes we kind of, we have been Buddhist for a long time. We think, yeah, you know, I, you know, I keep the five precepts or whatever, whatever everyone, you know, kind of everyone does that in my circle of friends. It's nothing special, but it is special. If you live according to these principles in a very deep way, speaking well, acting well, even trying to think well, the Buddha says you are living a noble life. Of course, we may not be able to live up to this 100% all the time, but you, at least you are leaning towards that. And it's always nice to get praised by the Buddha, isn't it? It's kind of, okay, you get praised by all sorts of scallywags in the world, and it doesn't really kind of, it doesn't cut much ice, right? I mean, okay, what, who cares about what some of these people say? Actually, we always feel, it's always nice to be praised, but sometimes we shouldn't really be too concerned about whether other people praise us or not, because they don't really understand anyway. But when the Buddha praises you, then it becomes really interesting, and then you know there must be something to this. So you are now practicing the noble way already, just by living a virtuous lifestyle. Uh, sense restraint, yeah, holding back from all of these aversions and all of these uh, desires in the world that overwhelm the mind and drag you out of the present into the past and the future. Another noble quality if you can practice that. Uh, situational awareness, knowing what you're doing, why you are doing things, uh, so it doesn't give rise to unnecessary unnecessary defilements. Again, another noble quality. Contentment, yeah? You can start to see why contentment is noble. Huh? So once you build up all of these things, uh, and this is also a kind of an important point here, huh? all of these things come first. Uh, and only when these things are established, uh, not fully perhaps, because establishing this fully is very difficult, but at least to some extent, uh, only then do you frequent a secluded lodging. Yeah? Only then do you come to Janagraho, maybe, I don't know. No, you don't have, this is not super secluded. It's kind of a halfway house a little bit. Yeah? Only then do you go on kind of a private retreat for two weeks, yeah, or a month or six months or whatever, because only then are you really ready for that. Yeah? If you haven't got these qualities already established, first of all, you can't really get the depth of meditation. So There's not really much point in kind of being completely secluded. But worse, you end up going nuts. Yeah, <laughs> this is worse. And you hear these stories about someone has been kind of in secluded for too long, and they come out with these large eyes. Yeah, yeah, I'm enlightened. Yeah, I've got it. And then they start talking, and you realize, actually, no, they haven't got it at all. They've gone completely off the rails, <laughs> and they kind of need to get out of their psychotic state. Okay, sit down, relax. Yeah, we're going to look after you. No, I'm enlightened. Listen, I've got it. This happens. It is not all that uncommon. If you want to be really secluded, you have to be very careful. Huh? Otherwise, you are, this is exactly what's going to happen. Huh? So keep this in mind, yeah? that actually the things that lead up to real meditation in Buddhism actually is a very demanding path. Yeah? This is, you know, all the things that we have been going through so far is pretty demanding. Yeah? It's not demanding in the sense that uh, it's difficult, but it's demanding in the sense that it takes quite a lot of training of the mind to get there. Yeah. Then uh, you freq frequent a secluded lodging. Yeah. Uh, the Pali word for secluded lodging is vivattang sanasanang. Vivattang is like viveka. Yeah? Viveka is uh, secluded or from the world. Uh, and these are the secluded lodgings. Yeah? These are examples of secluded lodging. The wilderness. Yeah? The root of a tree, a hill, I guess it depends what kind of hill, but you know, a wild hill, a, a ravine, a mountain cave, a charnel ground. People don't usually like to ha like charnel grounds, it's a good place for seclusion. Uh, the forest, the open air, and a heap of straw. My perfect, my, my, I think the best one is a heap of straw, I like that one. Uh, it's kind of really relaxing, a large heap of straw, it's kind of a Kind of a nice one, Palala Punja in Pali here. Uh, it doesn't mention uh, an empty hut there, but an empty hut is mentioned many, many other places in the suttas. Sunyagara literally means an empty lodging. Uh, so that is kind of also implied here. I think uh, 
all of these places could have an empty hut yeah, uh, within them, or as part of them. Yeah. So these are the um, uh, secluded lodgings. And the, of course, the idea is to be away from people, away from civilization, uh, so that you can get, these, uh, get that ideal environment for meditation practice. Uh. So that is the background. And then uh, you go into the arms round in the village, and after the village, yeah, you go back to your heap of straw, uh, and you sit down on your heap of straw, uh, you cross your legs, uh, put your body straight, uh, and you establish mindfulness right there. Now, that formula that you see there is the standard formula that you find everywhere in the suttas for meditation practice. Uh, this is the standard formula you find right there in front of the, at the beginning of the Anapanasati Sutta. Mindfulness of breathing is exactly the same. Uh, so for that reason, you know that what we are doing now is meditation. Uh, it may not be obvious because it talks about abandoning the five hindrances, right? Uh, and it says you abandon that hindrance, you abandon that one. It doesn't say how you do it. Uh, but the context clearly is meditation because this is exactly what how meditation is described uh, elsewhere in the suttas. Uh, and because uh, anapanasati, mindfulness of breathing, is really the high main way described by the Buddha to do satipatthana practice, uh, this is also satipatthana practice. This is meditation, it's mindfulness of breathing, it's satipatthana, it is giving up the five hindrances. All of these things is one and the same thing. Yeah? That's what the Buddha is saying. This is what really comes out of this. Uh, this is not obvious at all. If I didn't tell you this after having studied the suttas for 30 years and it took me 25 years to discover this myself or something like that, it's very hard to gra grasp that. But once I point it out, it's probably fairly obvious as well. So this is all about meditation practice. And now that is a, an interesting point because if it is about meditation practice yeah, and we know that you cannot do meditation unless your mind is already quite pure. Yeah, that's why we have had gone through the sense restraint. That's why we have gone through the contentment formula, all of these things, before we get to meditation. What that does, it says something about the nature of the five hindrances. The five hindrances are not coarse things in the mind. The five hindrances are not the coarse kind of defilements of aversion and ill will and desire. They cannot be that because they have already be, been abandoned. Otherwise, we can't do meditation practice. So the five hindrances, really, what they refer to are refined defilements of the mind that remain at the very last stage, where together that we actually abandon with, through meditation practice. That is what five hindrances actually mean in the suttas. And that's why you find that the five hindrances are sometimes referred to as upakilesa. Upakilesa is a refined hindrance. Kilesa is a word which means defilement. It's actually not a very common word in the suttas at all. It is much more common in later tradition, but it's found in a few suttas in the Anguttara Nikaya. But upakilesa is actually found more often. And the five hindrances are said to be upakilesas. If you go to the a famous sutta, the Upakilesa Sutta, in the middle length sayings, Majjhima Nikaya 128. Uh, there the Buddha talks about his own meditation before his awakening. Yeah? And he talks about the Upakilesas. And when you read them, you realize these are the refined hindrances that stops the Buddha to be from entering the jhana states. Then he overcomes those Upakilesas, then he's able to enter jhana. These upaklesas include things like fear, yeah, as you meditate. They include the dullness of the mind, the slight restlessness of the mind. Uh, and so you can recognize the hindrances in those upaklesas. Uh. So this is an, an important point uh, when you read the suttas, that these are fairly refined things. Uh, and we tend to use the idea of hindrances as if it refers to all defilements, uh, but not really. These are a special subset of defilements. Uh, that refers to what is, remains towards the very uh, end before you kind of enter deep states of samadhi. Huh? So this is what we're going to look at. Uh, next, we're going to discuss these uh, uh, defilements uh, and then how to overcome them completely because only when you overcome these defilements is it possible to really enter samadhi. But very briefly, 
sit down cross-legged. Yeah, this is the kind of ideal meditation posture in Buddhism. Doesn't mean you have to sit down cross-legged, uh, especially in the modern world, we grow up sitting on chairs uh, and it's not comfortable for many people to sit cross-legged. Uh, if it is not comfortable, if you can't do it properly, sit on a chair, sit on a stool, do something else, make sure you're comfortable. It matters enormously. Yeah. Setting up the body straight, yeah, you will notice that it only happens at this point when the mind is already quite clear and content. That's when you sit straight. Uh, if you're very tired or out of it, don't try to kind of force yourself into a straight posture at the wrong time because usually it just leads to stress if you do that. First of all, lean back a little bit against the wall, allow yourself to relax, and then when they clear out the kind of, the, the kind of murky aspects of the mind, then kind of mindfulness arises, okay, now you straighten the body. When mindfulness is there, it feels natural to have a straight body because it kind of clears up the mind even more. Yeah, and then you establish mindfulness right there. Yeah, and that establishing of the mindfulness is what we kind of talk about. Every day in meditation, we start off by establishing the mindfulness, allowing the world to kind of fade away, yeah, using the little techniques of enjoying the present moment, of abandoning the worldly concerns and all of these kind of things. And then when mindfulness is established, that is where meditation starts to happen. Where is mindfulness established? In the present, in the present space, in the present time. That's why mindfulness is like right there, yeah? In front of you, knowing the breath that is in the present space, and in the present time means not in the past and the future. That's kind of what this is about. So, there we are. We are now ready to talk about the five hindrances, and that will be this afternoon. So please continue enjoying yourself, have a nice lunch, and we'll see you again at 3 o'clock this afternoon. Yeah.